A 60-year-old male presented to the OPD with complaints of painless hematuria. Hematuria means blood in urine. An ultrasonogram revealed a 2 cm mass in the urinary bladder. The patient underwent cystoscopy and a tumour resection was done at the same time. To be able to solve cases like this, you need to understand the anatomy of the urinary, urinary bladder. We will describe and demonstrate the urinary bladder under the following subheadings. Position, features, important peritoneal and other relations, blood supply, nerve supply, lymphatic drainage and clinical aspects. Two important competencies which we need to cover are explain the anatomical basis of suprapubic cystostomy and describe the neurological basis of automatic bladder. The urinary bladder is a hollow viscous with muscular walls whose main function is to store urine and help in the voiding of urine. It is a hollow viscous to allow it to accommodate the urine and it is, its walls are muscular to give it distensibility as well as the ability to contract when the urine has to be expelled. The muscle which is forming its wall is known as detrusor. Its size, shape and pos position and relations vary according to its content. When we talk about the position of the urinary bladder, there are certain things which we need to understand. The urinary bladder is separated from the pubic bones by this space which is called the retropubic space. The retropubic space separates the urinary bladder from the pubic bone and it lies, the urinary bladder lies posterior to the pubic bones and the pubic symphysis. The upper border of the urinary bladder is in line with the upper border of the pubic symphysis and the neck of the urinary bladder, that is the lowermost portion where it becomes continuous with the urethra, is about 3 to 4 centimeters behind the pubic symphysis, the lower end of the pubic symphysis, and it is just a little bit above the pubic symphysis, right? So these are important points to remember that its superior border is at the level of the upper border of the pubic symphysis and its lowermost portion that is the neck of the urinary bladder is posterior to 3 to 4 centimeters posterior to the pubic symphysis and just a little bit above its level. Depending upon the amount of content of the urinary bladder, the urinary bladder, the surfaces and the borders of the urinary bladder differ. Now we will start with when the bladder is empty. An empty bladder is tetrahedral in shape. Since there is no way I can show you a gross specimen, so uh, let's take a simile. So first fold your hands as if you are going to pray. Now see to it, now position them in such a way that they are at right angles to your chest. Right? The tips of your fingers are facing forward, the thumbs are facing superiorly. Right? Now when you are in this particular position, we imagine this is an empty urinary bladder. Now let me teach you the surfaces on this and then I will come on to the picture. Now when you are looking at this, the, let's start with the surfaces. The tip of your index fingers are the apex of the urinary bladder. Right opposite the apex is going to be the base. So the wrist where your wrists are, the surface of your hands in between your wrists which is facing towards your chest is the base of the urinary bladder. The surface where you can see the thumbs, this is the superior surface and the dorsum of both your hands forms the inferior lateral surfaces. So we have an apex, a base, a superior surface and the inferior lateral surfaces. Surfaces are separated by borders. So the tips of all your fingers form the anterior border. The index fingers of both the sides form the lateral border and whatever would be joining an imaginary line which is going to be joining the uh, which would be separating the superior surface from the base would be the posterior border. 
Now let's see this on this picture. This is the apex of the urinary bladder, right? Right opposite the apex is the base. So this part which is in between where the two, the two angles where the ureters are joining and thereafter are entering, not joining. The ureters are entering the urinary bladder and this portion would be the base of the urinary bladder. Okay, forget the transparency, ignore the transparency. You're looking at the base of the urinary bladder. This surface would be the superior surface. This surface would be the inferior lateral surfaces. The two sides inferior lateral surfaces are separated by this which is the anterior border. The inferior lateral surfaces are separated from the superior surface by this which is the lateral border and the superior surface is separated from the base by this border which is the posterior border. Where, wherever the two inferior lateral surfaces, the uh, base, all these surfaces are coming in contact, that is the area from where the urethra is starting. And that is the area of the neck of the urinary bladder would be somewhere here where the, the urinary bladder is getting continuous with the urethra. Now let's start with the relations of the individual surfaces of the urinary bladder. Now to understand this picture, imagine you are inside the pelvic cavity and from the inside of the pelvic cavity, you are looking outside. So this is a posterior view. What can you see? You can see the rectus abdominis muscle out here. So this is the internal aspect of the rectus abdominis muscle. These are the pubic bones which are present out here. And we are inside and this is the urinary bladder. What we see clearly is the base of the urinary bladder. And you can see the two ureters entering. This would be the base of the urinary bladder. And this would be the superior surface of the urinary bladder. This right at the end is the apex. That was your pointed index finger. This is the apex of the urinary bladder and from the apex you can see a structure which is continuing towards the umbilicus. This is the urecus. The urecus is the remnant of allantois, what you studied in embryology. Go back, revise and then you'll be clear about it. Now this is also known as the median umbilical ligament and when the parietal peritoneum moves on it, it forms the median umbilical fold. Also in this picture, you can see the other structures which are running with it. This is the median umbilical fold, which is formed by, uh, this, this is the median umbilical fold was the urecus. This is the medial umbilical fold, which is formed by the obliterated umbilical artery. And this is the lateral umbilical fold, which is formed by the inferior epigastric vessels. All these structures are an important laparoscopic landmark. What do you mean by that? Now, when we are doing laparoscopic surgery, you have understood this, that you have scopes which are going inside. You have not opened the patient completely, but you have scopes which are going inside the patient. You are doing whatever needs to be done from within without opening the patient. Now, while, while, when you are looking in the abdominal cavity through these scopes, you need to have some structure which gives you a bearing of where you are, which is the anterior aspect or whether you are looking at the anterior aspect or posterior aspect in the abdominal cavity. So at that time, these structures, these folds, the median umbilical fold, the medial umbilical fold and the lateral umbilical folds form important laparoscopic landmark. The urogicus is also said to anchor the bladder to the anterior abdominal wall. Now what is the other importance of the urogicus? The other clinical significance of urogicus is that it can result in certain conditions like the urinary fistula, urinary cyst and a urinary sinus. Now let's understand these. Usually the urecus gets fibrosed completely. There is this structure which is moving from the urinary bladder towards the umbilicus and barring a few, uh, a few centimeters out here, the remaining part of the urecus is usually fibrosed all the way up to the umbilicus. However, if it remains patent as in this particular condition, it results in urecal fistula. Now, every time the urinary bladder contracts to expel urine, the urine will not only move towards the urethra, but also move towards, through, towards the umbilicus through this 
patency which is there the uracal fistula this would result in results in weeping umbilicus another condition which can take place that it gets fibrosed in its lower part as well as in the upper part near the umbilicus but in the middle a part of it remains patent now this patent area is lined by mucosa which starts secreting secretions and after a, after some time the secretions get accumulated to form a uracal cyst another condition which can exist is the uracal sinus now the part which is near the urinary bladder gets fibrosed but distally this particular area is still patent and it is lined by mucous membrane again so this mucous uh, this mucous membrane also starts secreting and it results in uracal sinus the base of the urinary bladder now it's a triangular area which is lying right opposite the apex of the urinary bladder so this was the base of the urinary bladder at the superior lateral angles enter the ureters the two ureters enter at its superior lateral angles and the urethra is present at its inferior angle now in both sexes that is in males as well as females the base of the urinary bladder is separated from the rectum by organs which are the part of the reproductive system and these are the internal organs of the reproductive system in males now the neck of the urinary bladder in uh, in males is surrounded by the prostate so this is the prostate but this is the surface which we are talking about which is the base of the urinary bladder so in males present in the uh, uh, adjacent to the base or pres are uh, is present the seminal vesicles these are pyriform structures that is pear shaped structure with an apex and a duct which is present out here these are convoluted and these are responsible for secretion of sperm uh, secretions of fructose mucus uh, mucus enzymes etc which are needed for the nutrition of the spermatozoa the duct this is the duct okay now the other structure is the vas deferens the vas deferens is the duct of the testis and the epididymis this is carrying the spermatozoa this part of the vas deferens which is present in relation to the base of the urinary bladder is dilated and is known as the ampulla the part this joins the duct of the vas deferens joins the duct of the seminal vesicles to form the ejaculatory duct in the prostate and together they open in the prostatic part of the urethra so the base of the urinary bladder in males in its lower part is related to the seminal vesicles as well as the ampulla of the vas deferens now to complete the relations of the base of the urinary bladder we need to discuss the peritoneum coverings of the ure of the male pelvis now this is the parietal peritoneum which is present on the posterior abdominal wall from there it moves over on the rectum it moves in such a way that it covers the lateral part and the anterior surface of the upper one third of the rectum it covers the middle part of the rectum only on its anterior surface and from here it moves on to the tip of the seminal vesicle at the tip of the seminal vesicle it turns covering 1.25 cm or half an inch of the base of the bladder before it moves on to the superior surface of the urinary bladder from the superior surface it moves on to the anterior the inner aspect of the anterior abdominal wall now this movement moving from the rectum to the base of the urinary bladder in this process it forms a pouch of peritoneum which is known as the recto vesical pouch or a potential space which is formed so the base of the urinary bladder is separated from the rectum by the recto vesical pouch in its superior aspect so that means the base part of the base at least half an inch of the upper part of the base is peritoneum it is covered by peritoneum then in its inferior part it is separated from the rectum by the seminal vesicles and the two seminal vesicles and the two ampulla of ductus deferens in between or the vas deferens in between we saw but there is another structure which is present out here can you see between the rectum and these organs of the male reproductive system which is known as the denonvillus fascia which is separating again the base from the rectum what is the denonvillus fascia so this rectovesical pouch 
in adults is present at a distance of about 7.5 centimeters from the anal opening. However, in fetuses, it is seen that it extends all the way up to the floor. So this is the extent of the rectovesical part. During development, these two layers come in close contact with each other and start to adhere with each other. Just like you saw, the second layer and the third layer of greater omentum had adhered to each other. Similar process of zygosis takes place out here also. So what remains, instead of this rectal vesical pouch which is extending all the way up to the, anal floor, to the pelvic floor, what remains is the denon villus fascia, right? So this is the origin how the denon villus fascia is formed and it's an important uh, clinical landmark especially when we are operate when the surgeons are operating on uh, the rectal cancers or prostatic cancers and urinary bladder cancers then it is an important structure to remember okay so now completing the base the base is separated from the rectum superiorly by the rectovesical pouch inferiorly by the seminal vesicles and ampulla of vas deferens there are two seminal vesicles and two ampullas of vas deferens and the denon villus fascia Now another important, the close contact between the male reproductive system uh, structures, internal reproductive structures and the rectum has been utilized by the clinicians during per rectal examination. So by, during per rectal, by doing a per rectal examination, they can palpate for the prostate as well as a pathological seminal vesicle. Now what happens in the female pelvis? What are the relations of the base of the urinary bladder in females? Again, let's start with the peritoneum. The peritoneum moves from the posterior abdominal wall onto the rectum. Now, in the re again, it covers in the upper one third of the anterior surface as well as the lateral surface of the rectum is covered. In the middle one third, it covers only the anterior surface. From here, it moves over the posterior surface of the uh, uterus, the vagina, as well as the uterus. This results in the formation of a recto-uterine pouch. It moves on to the anterior surface. It covers the anterior surface of the rectum uh, of the uterus. It covers the anterior surface of the uterus and at the level of the internal os, that is where the uterine body gets con uh, uh, continuous with the cervix. It moves on to the superior surface of the urinary bladder. It covers the superior surface of the urinary bladder and thereafter moves on to the anterior abdominal wall. So the base in females is non-peritoneal. It is not covered by peritoneum. The, the upper surface is not covered by peritoneum like in, in males. It is related to the supravaginal part of the cervix as well as to the anterior vaginal wall. The base is, separate, is related to the anterior vaginal wall and the supravaginal part of the cervix. The inferior lateral surfaces. Now, the inferior lateral surfaces are below the peritoneum. So, the peritoneum, now this is what you are seeing is a coronal section. So, the peritoneum moved from the lateral pelvic walls over the dome of the urinary bladder and then moved on to the other lateral pelvic wall. So, this part, the inferior lateral surfaces, these are the two inferior lateral surfaces, are separated from the levator and I and obturator internus by this pad of fat. This again is the retropubic, retropubic pad of fat. So the inferior lateral surfaces are not covered with peritoneum. They are in relation to the levator and I and the obturator internus. The two inferior lateral surfaces meet below the apex at the anterior border and these are and these are related to the retropubic space which also con which contains the vessels and nerves which are going to be present out here. So again now we are seeing from the top inside the pelvic cavity this is the urinary bladder this is the apex it has been reflected so this space which is present which is present which is separating the urinary bladder from the pubic bones and the pubic symphysis and this space on the side is the retropubic space the retropubic space of red cyst is a horseshoe shaped space hush horseshoe shaped space contains the retropubic pad of fat which is basically made of a loose areola tissue and contains the vesical plexus of veins in it. The neck of the urinary bladder. This is the most fixed part of the urinary bladder. It is present 3 to 4 centimeters behind the lower end of the pubic symphysis just above the pubic symphysis. 
it is the site of the internal urethral orifice so urethra imagine the urethra like a tube so the internal tube the internal end of the tube is present is one the one which is in contact with the urinary bladder at its neck in females it is related to the anterior vaginal wall if you look at the diagrams of the male and the female pelvis you will be able to uh, understand this so in females it is related to the anterior vaginal wall in males it is surrounded by the prostate the base of the prostate is present in attachment to it now to the neck of the uh, urinary bladder are attached important ligaments these are the pubovesical ligaments in females and the pubeprostatic ligaments in males they extend from the neck of the urinary bladder to the lower part of the pubic symphysis and these also help to anchor the urinary bladder in its position the superior surface of the urinary bladder the superior surface of the urinary bladder is covered with peritoneum variably in male and female pelvis i hope you know how to draw both these diagrams they are very very important in the male pelvis this is the superior surface it is related to the coils of ileum and the sigmoid colon and it is covered with peritoneum completely in cases of female pelvis the entire superior surface is not covered by peritoneum it is related to the antiverted uterus as well as a part of it of the superior surface is related to the supravaginal part of the cervix from which it is separated by connective tissue and the uh, superior surface is also related to the uterovesical part now what happens when the bladder distends when the bladder distends it arises and moves from the pelvis from the area of the lesser pelvis into the area of the greater pelvis and comes in contact with the anterior abdominal wall when it gets reflected see this part of the urinary bladder has moved between the anterior abdominal wall and has stripped off the peritoneum from it so the peritoneum has got stripped off the urinary bladder has moved in that space which is present between the anterior abdominal wall and the peritoneum the peritoneum has been moved away stripped away from the anterior abdominal wall by the expanding urinary bladder normally it can move up to 5 to 7 cm above the pubic bone now its surfaces and borders has have changed the anterior border would get expanded to accommodate the urine so now it has an anterior inferior surface and a posterior superior surface apart from the two lateral surfaces an apex and a base which is still fixed and it's in its usual position right now there are certain important aspects which are associated with the superior surface of the bladder and a distended bladder now if this distended bladder gets ruptured due to usually due to trauma now in case the rupture of the bladder is on this anterior in, anterior inferior surface that is the part which is below the peritoneum in between the anterior abdominal wall and the peritoneum this particular part if this part surface ruptures this is known as an extra peritoneal rupture of the urinary bladder and how would it rupture due to fracture pelvis a pelvic bone may get fractured and it may uh, tear the urinary bladder resulting in urine as well as blood extravasating all over this particular area okay so this is extra peritoneal rupture of urinary bladder in case the due to trauma which however it is the superior surface gets ruptured now there would be a breach in peritoneum and the urine as well as blood would extravasate into the peritoneal cavity so this this is about the bladder rupture the next important point which we do is for the urinary retention for understanding urinary retention and suprapubic cystostomy now for whatever reason the bladder is unable to function and the, that is the urine does not pass it gets accumulated in the bladder but it does not pass from the bladder out it does not expel to the exterior so what are the options which a person has either a urethral catheter can be passed that is through the normal passages of the catheter through the entire urethra into the urinary bladder and then the urine would come it get expelled outside in which would be collected in a bag now for uh, if there is an injury to the urethra and there is a stricture that is narrowing of the urethral passages so the urethra uh, the we cannot pass this catheter into the urethra what would we do then 
we would do what is known as a suprapubic cystostomy. We would take advantage of the fact that the bladder has come in contact with the anterior abdominal wall and it is in contact of it can be in contact about 5 to 7 centimeters. So a catheter is passed above the pubic bones that is why suprapubic catheter into the urinary bladder to expel the urine. Some small procedures can also be done through this methodology through the suprapubic uh, cystostomy passage. Now let's discuss the interior of the bladder. Now we need to know how the normal bladder interior looks like because what we started our case in the beginning of the lecture had a cystoscopy which was done on it. By cystoscopy we mean a tube fitted with a lens is introduced into the bladder that is a cystoscope is introduced into the bladder to look at the bladder from the inside. So we should know what is the normal before we can decide anything abnormal which is present. The entire mucosa of the urinary bladder is thrown into folds. These folds tend to disappear. These folds tend to disappear when the bladder distends with urine. However, there is a part of the area which is smooth, this triangular area, which is present on the interior of the base of the urinary bladder is known as the trigone. At the two ends of this triangular area are the two superior lateral ends are the urethric orifices and at its apex is the opening of the internal urethral orifice. The ureters when they enter into the bladder pierce the bladder musculature. After they have pierced the bladder musculature there is a part of the uh, there is a part of the ureter which runs inside the muscular walls and this is known as the intramural part of the ure of the ureters. These ureters then open through oblique openings. These urethral orifices are oblique inside the bladder. It is important to remember the shape because in cases of in case of certain diseases it becomes circular. So to be able to differentiate, we should know normally it is an oblique opening. And at this oblique opening, we uh, usually can see urine being ejected out by peristalsis at the rate of four to five drops per minute. Now, the two openings, the two urethral openings, are joined by the interuretric crest or the interuretric fold. This is formed how the longitudinal coat of muscles of the ureters of both the sides become continuous with each other and form a triangular layer of muscle underneath this entire mucosa which is known as the superficial muscle trigonal muscle of Bell. So underneath the mucosa instead of submucosa being present in the trigone is the superficial muscle of bell and then is the detrusor. So normally if I was to talk about the muscular of the walls of the urinary bladder at this point it would be mucosa, submucosa, then the detrusor and then the connective tissue on the outside. Out here in the area of the trigone it would be mucosa. Underneath it would be the superficial muscle of trigonal the trigonal muscle or muscle of bell and thereafter would be the detrusor and then the connective tissue and that is why because there is no submucosa out here the mucosa appears smooth. This at its lower or the apex of the trigone is the urethral opening. Now the distance in case the bladder is empty the distance between this interuretric uh, the, between the two urethral orifices is about 2.5 centimeters and it becomes 5 centimeters when the bladder is distended. Another structure which is seen in middle aged men is just behind the urethral opening would be uvula vesica. Now, what is uvula vesica? The median lobe of the prostate below the urinary bladder in males is the prostate. The median lobe of the prostate which tends to start enlarging with age tends to protrude inside tends to protrude in the interior of the urinary bladder and raises a projection which is known as the uvula vesica. During cystoscopy, what is seen in the urinary bladder? The entire mucosa is thrown into folds except in the region of the trigone. The mucosa is pink. The mucosa over the trigone is smooth. 
an interuretric ridge can be seen which helps you again to get your get it acts as a guide and get the bearing the, gets the surgeon his bearing and the urethral orifice can be seen then also the shape of the urethral orifices has to be noticed and also what has to be noticed is that the urine is uh, ejecting out by peristalsis from these urethral orifices so in our case the cystoscopy was performed that is through the urethra a cystoscope which is a tube with a lens fitted in it was passed into the urinary bladder and in that particular gentleman there were tumors out here the tumors were resected and removed so that the um, uh, the and that do that and those tumor ma tumor masses were responsible for the hematuria which the patient was having the tricone is embryologically different from the rest of the bladder you need to find out why it is the most fixed part of the urinary bladder and the mucosa here is smooth so this is how the trigone is different from the rest of the urinary bladder the ligaments of the urinary bladder as we have already discussed the neck of the urinary bladder in females is connected to the lower border of the pubic symphysis by pubovesical ligaments and these become the puboprostatic ligaments in males let's try and understand this complicated looking figure now this is the interior of the pelvis we are looking from the top we chopped off the various organs so what are we seeing out here this is the open end of the urinary bladder whose dome and the upper surfaces have been superior surface has been removed the uterus has been removed and this is the cervix which we are seeing and this is the rectum this is the lateral pelvic walls and the viscera is present in the midline now from the look at this 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 side goes on a more superficial plane and this side represents a deeper plane more on the um, towards the pelvic diaphragm okay now the urinary bladder has certain ligaments attached to it these ligaments are condensations of pelvic fascia now on the lower aspect that is nearer to the pelvic diaphragm are the pubovesical and the puboprostatic ligaments so here from the neck of the urinary bladder going towards the pubic bone this is the pubic bone as well as going towards the white line which is present on the levator ni are the medial and the lateral pubovesical ligaments to the apex is attached the uraecus right that is also a ligament uh, uh, the and above more superficially more towards the abdominal aspect is attached the lateral ligaments of the urinary bladder now what are these ligaments uh look at the blood vessels this is the external iliac vessels these are the internal iliac vessels the viscera is present in the midline the vessels are present laterally and posterior laterally actually from the vessels arise this internal iliac arise branches which are going to supply the various viscera now while these branch uh, these vessels are moving towards the viscera there is condensation of the pelvic fascia happening around us and this condensation of the pelvic fascia results in formation of ligaments and with the urinary bladder moving is the lateral ligament the lateral ligament extends from the base of the urinary bladder to the lateral pelvic wall and in this are present the various vessels and nerves and the veins which are present which are going towards or going away from the urinary bladder also related to the urinary bladder which is another set of ligaments which connects the urinary bladder to the sacrum and these are known as the sacrogenital folds or the sacrogenital ligaments so these are actually true ligaments and in these ligaments we have to remember our vessels and nerves which are running through it because when we are trying to remove the urinary bladder we will need to clamp the vessels out here and they at that laterally and they are present in these ligaments so these ligaments act as a landmark for moving towards the urinary bladder the blood supply of the urinary bladder as we saw there are these blood vessels are present the arteries are present in and the veins are present in the ligaments now since this is one of the first viscerals which you are doing and you haven't really uh, studied about the blood vessels this is the abdominal aorta the abdominal aorta divides into the two common iliac the in front of the sacroiliac joint the common iliacs divide into an external iliac and an internal iliac the internal iliac divides into a posterior division and an anterior division 
The posterior division supplies mainly the pelvic walls the, and the uh, gluteal region. The anterior division gives rise to vessels, the arteries, for not only the viscera but also the pelvic wall. Now we need to know, we need to see two important vessels, the superior vesicle artery. The superior vesicle artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac, which supplies the superior surface and part of the inferior lateral surfaces of the urinary blood. The proximal part of it, the superior vesicle artery, the distal part of this vessel, which moves on to the anterior abdominal wall to form the obliterated umbilical artery. The inferior vesicle artery, which supplies the base, it also gives rise in males. It also supplies the prostate, the seminal vesicles and other structures. Could be a branch of either the middle rectal artery or the anterior division of the internal ilia. In females, it can be, it is a branch of the vaginal artery. Together, the superior and the inferior vesicle artery supply the urinary bladder. They move from the lateral pelvic walls towards the, med, uh, towards the midline where the urinary bladder is situated. The veins. The veins of the urinary bladder again now move from the medial aspect towards the lateral pelvic wall within these ligaments. They form a vesical venous plexus which in males is present at the junction between the urinary bladder and the prostate. From here arise the vesical veins which move into the internal iliac veins, then the common iliac veins and thereafter into the inferior vena cava. We will discuss the importance of it when we are doing the uh, male reproductive system. The lymphatic drainage. There is a widespread lymphatic drainage from the urinary bladder. It moves towards the external iliac lymph nodes, mainly the lymph drains towards the external iliac lymph nodes. From there, it moves towards the common iliac lymph nodes and then to the lymph nodes which are present around the abdominal iota. Some of the lymph nodes also move towards the uh, internal iliac group of lymph nodes. Some of the area also drains towards the internal iliac group of lymph nodes and the obturator nodes which are present in the pelvis. The innervation of the urinary bladder. Now this is the tricky part of the entire urinary bladder, the innervation. Because it's a viscera, it is going to be supplied by the autonomic nervous system. That is, it will have a sympathetic set of nerves coming to it and a parasympathetic set of nerves which are going to be coming to it. And it has to perform what function? One, it should be able to fill and then it should be able to contract to expel the urine. To be able to do that, it has the sympathetic nerves, nerves which are coming to it and the parasympathetic. Now, this is the sympathetic chain which is running on the lumbar vertebrae on both the sides. It's running right from the base of the skull to the first coccygeal vertebra where the both the, the sympathetic trunks of both the sides join together to form the ganglion impar. They are running behind the iliacs. Now from the sympathetic trunk arise the lumbar splanchnic nerves. Do you remember splanchnic nerves? We had done them in thorax. The greater, the lesser, the least splanchnic nerves. That is, what are these? That is, splanchnic nerves are those in which the preganglionic Sympathetic fibers do not synapse in these ganglions but moves unsynapsed to some other area, to some other plexus where they synapse. So these nerves come together, the lumbar splanchnic nerves come and form the superior hypogastric plexus in front of the sacral promontory. So we have lumbar splanchnic from one side, the lumbar splanchnic from the other side and from above medially is coming the intermesentric plexus. Together they have formed a superior hypogastric plexus. Now these splanchnic nerves now synapse in the superior hypogastric plexus, the ganglion cells which are present there and the postganglionic splanchnic fibers then tend to form two hypogastric inferior hypogastric plexus that is the right and the left inferior hypogastric plexuses which move on the lateral side of the viscera. So these are the two hypogastric plexuses which are going. So this was the superior hypogastric plexus and these are the two inferior hypogastric plexuses which are moving on the sides of the viscera. You can see them moving on the sides of the rectum as well as the uh, urinary bladder. So this is the male pelvis. Now also joining these 
are the pelvic splanchnic nerves these are the parasympathetic component of the uh, pelvic innervation which arises from the pelvic splanchnic splanchnic nerves so that is the sacral segments of s2 s3 and s4 the spinal segments of s2 s3 s4 had that nucleus of onof in it which gives rise to the pelvic splanchnic nerves these are again preganglionic parasympathetic fibers which have joined these hypogastric plexuses now this plexus when it's near the rectum will be supplying the rectum so this is the rectal plexus and when it comes in near the urinary bladder we will call it as the vesical plexus the autonomic innervation of the urinary bladder the sympathetic part comes from the lumbar splanchnic nerves which arise from t10 to l2 spinal segments they enter the preganglionic fibers enter into the superior hypogastric plexus from which arises the postganglionic fibers which now run and form the inferior hypogastric plexus the sympathetic fibers inhibit the detrusa and stimulate the sphincter vesicae that is they are going to help in filling of the urinary bladder i'll come to it again the parasympathetic fibers arise from the pelvic splanchnic nerves they also form a part of the inferior hypo gastric plexus they stimulate the detrusa and inhibit the sphincter vesic now for this is the urinary bladder now look at this now the urinary bladder is going to get this innervation from the sympathetic system this will be the internal urethral orifice where there is this sphincter vesicae in internal urethral orifice and this will be the external sphincter the external sphincter is under voluntary control it is being supplied this was the muscles of the urogenital diaphragm the sphincter vesicae which was present this is being supplied by the pudendal now whereas the urinary bladder and the internal sphincter is going to be supplied by the autonomic nerves for filling to take place the detrusa should be relaxed the bladder neck should be closed and the external sphincter should also be contracted for voiding to take place the detrusa should contract and the bladder neck should be relaxed the muscles should be relaxed as well as the external sphincter should be relaxed right now what how does the voiding reflex takes place let's start from infants in infants when they are born you see that they need to they just tend to urinate they have a feed and then they tend to urinate so what is happening reflexes or the afferent information is going from the bladder to the spinal cord the spinal once it fills up the information goes from the bladder to the spinal cord a reflex efferent information passes by the pelvic splanchnic nerves and the pudendal nerves to the bladder which causes the infants to uh, urinate so the bladder fills and a reflex autonomic stretch reflex takes place and the bladder contracts and the uh, the infant tends to till toilet training is done the infant tends to urinate when wherever the child wants to once in uh, the toilet training has taken place now what happens the afferent information passes from the urinary bladder and this information usually passes via the uh, pelvic splanchnic nerves to the spinal cord to the onus nucleus from here the information travels via the fasciculus gracilis to the nucleus gracilis through the medial lemniscus some fibers going on to the pons to thalamus the paracentral lobule and the inferior frontal gyrus when the time is right when the correct place is there then the inferior frontal gyrus sends the information via the upper motor neurons of the pyramidal and extrapyramidal tract to the spinal cord and the via the pelvic splanchnic nerves and the pudendal nerve then the bladder that is the detrusa contracts and the sphincter vesicae relaxes the internal urethral orifice relaxes and then the person tends to urinate that is the higher control which comes in for the control of the voiding reflex pain from the urinary bladder travels via the spinal via the sympathetic fibers to the spinal cord and moves via the spinothalamic tract to the thalamus and thereafter to the various areas of the brain now what happens when there is disruption how does the disruption of micturition take place now there is a spinal cord injury taking place 
right now depending upon where the spinal cord injury is the effects of the effects of that injury will come on the urinary bladder just like we had what we have done for various other sensations now if there is a spinal cord injury say uh, at the upper levels at this present moment uh, above the sacral segments now there is a spinal cord injury which is taking place the person is initially in the phase of spinal shock the bladder is atonic and hyporeflexive bladder that is it distends and it finally overflows the detrusor muscle is relaxed the sphincter vesicae is contracted and the sphincter urethra is relaxed so it just distends to its capacity which it has to distend and then it tends to overflow now after a few weeks when the patient has been stabilized and all those whatever spinal reflexes whatever reflexes had to come back and whatever neural neural activity has returned the patient will have an automatic blood what do you mean by an automatic blood now the information the spinal cord is injured right so the information is not moving from the spinal cord to the higher centers so bladder fills and it empties reflexively every 1 to 4 hours it becomes like young children before toilet training it's a simple reflex act it fills it empties it fills it empties it is an automatic reflex bladder or a hyper reflexic bladder because again and again it fills and empties it fills and empties then the detrusor muscle tends to become uh, it becomes it hypertrophies and the reflexes become very very hyper and there's a small capacity bladder which takes place so this automatic bladder is an important competency as we had see uh, we had we discussed in the beginning of the chapter what is an automatic bladder that is it is one in which there is and there is no connection between the spinal cord as well as the brain there is an upper neuron upper motor neuron injury which is taken place it becomes the reflex is acting on its own without the intervention of the higher brain center it fills it empties so it is automatic it's on its own it can function now if there is an injury in the sac sacral segments or these afferents the pelvic splanchnic nerves are destroyed or the if pudendal nerves are destroyed now what has happened is what how can they take place when we are performing a surgery on the prostate radical prostatectomy and in uh, surgery is being done or a hysterectomy is being done now these these afferent deferents can get damaged or suppose there is an injury to the spinal cord sacral segments are destroyed now the bladder is without control from the sacral segments also so what is what will happen the wall will become flaccid it fills to its capacity and it overflows there is continual dribbling ab to uske par koi bhi asar nahi koi there is nobody responsible there is nobody controlling it it is an autonomous bladder right so you need to understand the atonic bladder automatic bladder and autonomous bladder automatic may reflex the sacral reflex spinal cord reflex is intact whereas in an autonomous bladder there is no reflex action taking place there is no higher center there is no reflex action at the sacral segments it's a lower motor neuron type of a lesion which has taken place with this we come to the end of the lecture what you need to do is you need to know what are the important diagrams which you need to make so you need to make this diagram which tells you the relations of the male urinary bladder so you should be able to make this diagram where there with this was the area of the recto vesical pouch which is related to the superior part of the base of the bladder and then the two seminal vesicles with the ampulla of the vas deferens in between which is related to the inferior part of the urinary bladder thereafter would be the fascia of denen villus and then would be the recto so this is an important diagram which you need to know how to the other is a diagram which tells you about the various surfaces and borders of the urinary bladder the third is a diagram of the interior of the urinary bladder please see to it that you've made all these diagrams along with the peritoneal relations of the male and female pelvis in your in your